Welcome to the Being Known Podcast with my friend, Dr. Kurt Thompson. My friend, Pepper Sweeney. We are here to discover and explore what it means to be truly known. Hey, Kurt. Hey, Pep. How are you today, buddy? With, I'm, I'm great. We've had, we've had some time to catch up before we started recording this. and Always a, always a great uh, time. Hmm. Part of my, one of my favorite things on Friday is to get together with you and Amy and yeah, and just sort of uh, share our lives and what's been going on. And um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, really time yeah. well spent. Yeah. Yeah. So we are here um, in uh, season eight of the Being Known podcast. Um, this is our fifth episode of this season, and um, we've been getting such great feedback. People really seem to be enjoying what we're doing here um, and, you know, uh, what we are trying to do this season is put ourselves in the path of oncoming beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, what we've been doing is um, almost giving an assignment every week uh, at the end of the episode so that um, people can be prepared uh, for listening and can engage even more um, with, with what we're going to be talking about. And so last week, we um, we told you that this week we would be discussing a film towards the end of the, mm. the episode. Mm. And that film is Shawshank Redemption. And I cannot wait to talk about it. Oh, <laughs> dude. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's so much, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that film eventually, but uh, you know, just a, a word about this, uh, today we're going to talk about how beauty affects memory, how it affects memory, but also what it means for us to, uh, how, how we are transformed by remembering beauty. And so we're exploring, uh, as we often do, we, we often use this framework of the nine domains of integration mm -hmm. from the world of interpersonal neurobiology as a way to frame our seasons in some way, shape or form. It's been helpful so far. And today we're really talking about the way that beauty shapes our memory and the way that memory then forms an anticipated future for us that is one of beauty and hope rather than catastrophe and carnage. You know, from the last episode, episode four, um, you know, we can recall that beauty integrates our mind. We, we talk about how it, it, first we sense it and then we are starting to make sense of it. And that when we allow ourselves to be in the presence of beauty for a long enough period of time, we are assisting it in that process. And then when we decide that we're gonna place ourselves with intention before beauty in its oncoming, like we're going to be on the path mm -hmm. of, of its coming to us, we give it an opportunity to uh, reveal things to us. And when that happens, it, it changes the nature of how we're experiencing, not just the beauty that we're encountering, but it changes the nature of our experience of ourselves. And so those kinds of experiences as they are changed enables us then to remember things differently. So now we turn to how beauty becomes embedded in us as a function of our capacity to remember. And, you know, we haven't really talked about it in, in on, on this podcast. We haven't talked about memory in these terms before that we're about to talk about it. But we, when we think about memory, we think about two things. Um, we think about how, first of all, memory isn't just a thing that, you know, we're able to do. I remember where I put my keys. I remember vacation from last summer. I remember that movie that I saw. Uh, but it, but I remember things primarily as a human. I remember things in order to be able to anticipate and predict the future. I remember how to put my pants on. I remember where the grocery store is so that when I drive to it, I will see what it is. I remember where danger is. I remember law. I remember in order for me to anticipate things. And there are in the brain, the brain body mind matrix, there are generally two tracks. These are, the, the, this, these are, this is my uh, shorthand for this. There are two tracks that are trains of memory, if you will, run on that enable us to uh, and, and inhabit time. Uh, we creatures uh, that are humans tell time like no other creatures do. We are able to remember features of our past. I don't just remember where I put things like a squirrel does, but I remember like what the harvest of last season's wheat was like compared to the year before. And I also anticipate a future in ways that animals don't. 
other animals don't anticipate. And one of those tracks, if you will, track number one is largely what we would call an implicit track. I remember things implicitly. We've talked about this in other episodes, the implicit form of memory. And that implicit remembering pattern is automatic. It involves parts of my brain, like my brain stem, my lower brain, my right hemisphere, my uh, parts, parts of my brain that don't have to do with my intentional need to remember things. I don't have to do it on purpose. I don't have to remember on purpose. I can just do it quite automatically and non-consciously. And as it turns out, for the most part, that's actually quite good. That's a mechanism that we need. I need to know that if like I, you know, if I hear a certain noise, I don't have to think what is that before I discover, oh, that's the noise. That's the sound of a car horn because I've stepped into oncoming traffic, which would not be like stepping into oncoming beauty. Like that would be a very different kind of experience. So a great deal of track one is meant for our safety and protection, our, our vigilance. We're looking for danger for reasons that are all really quite good that lead to our flourishing. The problem with track one, the challenge with, proc, with track one is that it also uh, is the track with which I remember things about my emotional and relational past that have been painful and wounding. And I can do this remembering all by myself. I don't need help from anybody else. I don't have to practice it. If I've had an experience of being humiliated somewhere, if I've had an experience of trauma, if I have an experience of shame, sadness, with which for you know for which nobody joins me, that will inhabit my memory, and that remembered past will be a past that leads me to anticipate a future of the same kind. And I can do this all by myself. I don't have to have anybody else do this for me. And because it's so effortless, I, the, the language I like to use is that we don't have to purchase a ticket to get on this train. Yeah. We're on I don't, it. we're on it. We are on it by default. And one of the features that is on that train, like, uh, like it is, is not on the other, the next track we'll talk about is the feature of condemnation or shame that often resides on that train. It's kind of the meal that we're served if we ride on that train long enough. This sense of I, when I remember my past, I, I, I enter into a state of regret in some way, shape or form. I should have done this. I should have done that. If only this had not happened to me, if only that had not happened to me, or I find myself in this place of grief, grief and regret is the only thing that I imagine when I think about my past, when I think about my future. I'm anticipating in a way with a posture of worry or anxiety. That's primarily what I'm doing. So the past of regret and grief, the future of anxiety and worry. But then we have a second track when we, when it comes to our embedding or imagining or inhabiting time. And the first thing that we would have to say about this is that it is explicit. It is intentional. It is conscious. I have to get on this train on purpose. I must purchase a ticket on purpose. And uh, as compared to what Huey Lewis in the news sing, right? When they say like the power of love, don't need mm -hmm. no credit card to ride this train. Mm -hmm. And I want to suggest that like, in fact, you do. In fact, it does not just like show up, like spring eventually shows up. I have to do this on purpose. Not only that, it's challenging enough that I need to do it most effectively with other people. I, other people help me do this. We get, we buy a ticket to you and I buy to you, Amy and I, we're going to buy tickets together to get on this train. And this track that we're riding with other passengers is governed by a posture of curiosity rather than condemnation. Shame is not going to be served on this train, but curiosity is going to be served on this train. Now, if we practice this train, if we practice riding this train, what we're going to discover is that when it comes to the past, we're actually more reflective. We're not regretful. We are reflective. I am with it, but I'm not reflecting by myself. I'm initially doing it with other people. Other people are helping me reflect. Today, you know, we each, before we started to record today, we each had some time for talking about our pasts, things that we've been doing, right. things that have not been easy. Right. 
and I and in that reflecting time with the two of you, your listening to me helps me be at ease and helps me therefore reimagine the experience of what the past event is really like because you're helping me reimagine but but I'm doing so not to just automatically be regretful I'm doing so for the purpose of being curious about this and what is God up to and how can I hear a different story in order then when we think about the future on track two we're really talking about planning I'm going to plan my future. I'm going to, with intention, begin to imagine a different future than the automatic one of anxiety and worry. I, but that takes work. It takes no work at all for me to worry about the future. Right. No work at all. This, I have to plan. And I can't tell you the countless number of times, and this is true for you, with, and for Amy, for other friends that we have, but with the three of us, I'll just talk about the three of us, the number of times when... Having named the things about my past, whether it's last week or five years ago, uh, that, uh, that enable me to know that I'm not by myself, that this enables me now to imagine a different future. I can plan to do this. And if we practice purchasing a ticket with others to get on this train on track two, over time, it can begin to feel more automatic, but only because we are purchasing a ticket over and over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah. And this gets, or or else I'm gonna default back to track one. That's where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna inhabit time on track one. But this gets, Pepper, to your, as we talk about remembering beauty and what beauty requires of us, it gets to that fourth W. Yeah, yeah, I work. Yes. Dude. Yeah. I mean, it's work even to get on the train. Dude. Tr train two. I mean, you know, you got Huey Lewis conducting train one, you know, it <laughs> takes no credit card to get on that one, but train two, you better break out the, this black card. Right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. And we, we know that our traumas tend to move us pretty quickly from track two, where we want to be inhabiting yep. time there to track back to track one yeah we forget beauty and we're gonna talk about this yeah it's like a shame slide you know you Dude. slide right back over to that other train it's because you you know even yeah <laughs> say it and you, you and got it, things well, to say well it's 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 like you know you you wish that you could get on train two and just every day, just get on it and stay on it all day long. And, you know, living where you're planning for the future and you're reflecting the past, but inevitably something comes up, inner voice or something, one of these memories that you have and you're like, no, that's, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that one. You're back on the other train. <laughs> just slide right over. Right. Right. Ugh. Right. Why, why do we have to keep doing that? Right, right. Well, you know, I, I think about you know the story that you uh, you told when, when I first heard you t tell it about um, going uh, to to be present with uh, Van Gogh's uh, the Lilacs. Yeah, yeah, right. You don't you don't yeah. just walk in and like look at that and say like, love that painting. Next, right, right. And you know the thing is about that that particular painting. I know the room that that's in. I can conjure that up right now. I know what mm -hmm. other artwork is in that room as I'm walking towards it. Mm -hmm. And I take my time with the other beautiful yeah. pieces in the room, but knowing that this is what I'm here for. This is what mm -hmm. I want to savor and stand mm -hmm. in front of and let it affect mm -hmm. me. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It takes work. It, takes, it work. takes work to do that. Otherwise we will forget beauty. We will stop paying attention to it. If we are not careful, we will stop paying attention to it as uh, a necessity, meaning, meaning uh, we, we, we won't see it as like, oh, no, beauty is necessary for us. And we'll start to categorize it as a luxury. And it's so easy. My wife and I just this morning had a conversation and she said, you know, because we're in the midst as we're recording this, we're in the midst of autumn. I mean, it's the mm -hmm. trees are, are beautiful right now and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but Nell said to me this morning, she said, you know, I've got to slow down mm. because I'm missing it. She said, mm. I'm missing the beauty of autumn because I'm, mm. I'm just mm. going, 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 going. So 
much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got so many distractions and Mm -hmm. everything else. And, and so we're purposely, you know, we had this conversation this morning and we're purposely setting some things down that are Mm -hmm. taking our attention Mm -hmm. so that we can be experiencing the beauty that's happening right outside our door, right outside, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. that, that, Mm -hmm. and it's right there. And yet we're on the wrong train and we're not, we're not paying attention Mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, as we record this here in mid to late October of 2023, uh, I'm, I'm aware of, you know, what's happening in the Middle East. And if you pick up the Washington post this morning, as I did, uh, there, I think I, 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 if I'm, if I'm, if I'm recounting correctly, I don't think there's a single story on the entire front page above or below the fold yeah. that would acknowledge that there's anything beautiful in the world. Right. It is all on track one. It's all on track one. It's a reactive um, expression of anxiety and worry. And I, this is, this is what happens when we are not willing to do the hard work of allowing ourselves to slow down. Uh, it, it's not as if, you know, God is waiting for us to do something in order for him to show up. He's like, he's waiting, right? Beauty is waiting for us. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I mean, there, I, I think, you know, it's not unlike, uh, Genesis chapter three, when, uh, after, you know, there's been the fruit fest and then God comes walking, right? Beauty is coming in the cool of the day in the afternoon and the woman and the man are hiding because our trauma, not only, uh, does it mess with our time travel, does it mess with how we inhabit time, but it also shatters our, uh, the, our, the posture with which we see beauty. So now beauty, instead of being our comfort and our convictor and our recommissioner, now beauty becomes our enemy. It becomes the thing that we're terrified of. We fear it without knowing it because we know that when beauty comes, if we, if we sit with it long enough, we know this in the pit of our soul, but we're so terrified of it that beauty is going to search us. If we allow to, if we allow ourselves to be with it long enough and shed light, not just on our joys and our longings, but it will also begin to touch our griefs from which we are often hiding. And this is because beauty does not just present itself as a beautiful thing. Oh, isn't this wonderful? If we sit with all beauty, any beauty will eventually find our wounds. It will search our memory to find our wounds. And so for those reasons, we will all, as much as we want it, we will avoid it without knowing that that's what we want to do. And it, just like hope, potentially becomes a dangerous thing. Because it will start to like, you know, if I'm, if I'm with beauty long enough, it starts to, you know, open up the doors and windows in my house in the house of my soul, where there are things that are still yet so disappointing, so broken, so ruptured. Uh, And I've worked really hard to not pay attention to that anymore. And I don't ever want to go back into that room because how dare you uh, tempt me to long for that rupture to be repaired when I've practiced believing that it can't be, whether it's my marriage or with my kids on substance abuse or you know, my parents or my work or my, my, my physical, my, my medical malady, whatever the suffering is. But we then see that beauty has an intention of healing. It doesn't just have an intention of just being there. Like it, it, its intention is to like, behold, I am the God who heals you. This is God speaking to the children of Israel in, in the book of Exodus, the, I am the God who heals you, but I'm also the God who is hovering and present as a way to do this. Beauty does not come and start slapping us around. Now it might, if I'm not paying attention to it, right? If I'm, you know, I have this book 
uh, called, uh, <laughs> oh gosh, it's called uh, Death in Grand Canyon. Lovely. And it's, <laughs> and it's basically an anthology of the number of different ways that people die in the Grand Canyon. Now, of course, there's the number one way in which people die, which is through exposure in some way, shape or form, which is like they die because they go off hiking or whatever, and they, you know, they don't take enough water or salt products with them or whatever, but also they, they just get lost, right? And then they're just exposed and, and, and they're found later. But then there are other, you know, like people who decide they're going to look through their camera viewfinder and walk toward the edge of the South Rim. Right. Uh, while they're walking or people who are going to like take their bicycles and they're going to how how close to the edge of the rim can i get before i right i mean people people do yeah right so 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 beauty you know we're not going to argue with it and it, and it makes no apologies but this this is it, it's patient and it does so it doesn't commit violence toward us ever but there are things that we do that are violent often in response to it. We see beauty, we can't tolerate it. We, we don't know how to interact with it. And so we, we come to it as immature toddlers and ride our bicycles off the edge. Or we, you know, here, let, I'm gonna take a selfie. I'm just gonna keep backing up because I'm actually not taking it nearly as seriously as we need to take it. But we find that beauty is not urgent. It is patient. It, like the children of Israel in Exodus 14, they get to the Red Sea and it's like, it's not going anywhere. And here comes Pharaoh and the army and they're like, crap. And, and they start grumbling to Moses. What have you done? You know, like three days ago, they were all happy to get up and go. And now they're like, what the heck? And so it is patient and it exposes our anxieties. But then it also makes a way through the sea. Also in Exodus 14, this wind comes. But it's interesting the way the wind, the wind did not come like we, we would be like, oh, we, we have this idea that like when, if, if, you, if you were to ask most people, well, so if, uh, if you were to imagine, what does Exodus 14 tell us about how long it took for God to part the sea? They say, well, doesn't he just like snap his fingers and, or at least, you know, Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments and right. it just like, boom, it just goes and it's like it takes all of about maybe 45 seconds. And yet the text reads, that a strong east wind blew throughout the night while the pillar of fire stood between Pharaoh and the Israelites. And I don't like beauty to take this long. I don't want the presence of someone else gazing upon my carnage to see beauty come from. Like I want it done. Uh, but the beauty of God is uh, so serious about being so thorough that he's going to take as long as it takes. And it took time to make a way through the sea. But once we get through the sea, also, like we see in Exodus 14 and 15, that once they get through, they remember it, right? Moses and his sister sang and wrote poetry reminding them. So when we remember beauty on purpose and celebrate it, we recall it then at other times when we find ourselves in other places of ugliness. We see that beauty does not keep us from grief or suffering, but rather it is with us in our grief and our suffering, but not without our cooperation. Not without our cooperation. Uh, being with us enables us to be less anxious and more hopeful and thereby more able to be creative, even in the face of disintegrating circumstances, which we're going to get to here in just a moment. And it provides healing as a function of pointing us Jesus. And it's Jesus intention for us to become the beauty on which we're meditating. This whole notion of beauty speaking to our trauma with intention, it's not, it's not just in the room. It just happens to be in the room like the chair is in the room, like the Rothko to my left here is in the room. 
It's in the room waiting for my cooperation such that with intention, the places where my woundedness uh, is unfinished business, it begins to come out into the room in order for it to be retold, a story that's told differently. And this takes extraordinary work, which leads us to our artistic offering yes. for the day. Yes. You know, <clears throat> it's so incredible. Just the things that you've been um, talking about here have conjured up, you know, so much that happens in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of hope being a dangerous thing. The idea of beauty has an intention you know, um, the idea of remembering moments of beauty where we find ourselves in the ugly. Um, <laughs> let me just start by, uh, I, I, I hope that you, our listeners have, uh, watched the movie this week. Mm. Um, if you haven't, maybe you can press pause now and, mm. and go find a way to watch it before you listen to the rest of this. Um, I, I had the opportunity to rewatch the movie this week. I haven't seen it in years. Mm. It is um, for sure, one of my favorite movies, top mm. five movies of mm -hmm. all time. And it's, it makes that, has that distinction for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, just a little bit of background. It was uh, directed by Frank Darabont, uh, 1994. And it is based on, and I'm sure you know this, it is based on a novella or a uh, short story novella that Stephen King wrote uh, called Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. The interesting thing to me is, even though this movie is on everybody's list, uh, as or on so many people's lists as being one of their most favorite movies, uh, it did not win an Oscar in any category. That's stunning. Um, stunning. It was stunning. up against, do you know what it was up against that year? I forget. Oh. Forrest Gump. Forrest <laughs> oh, Gump God. won oh, everything. And there's nothing wrong with Forrest Gump. Right. I mean, you know, uh, it, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't impact me as much as this movie does mm -hmm. um for for whatever reason but i think it was it was great but it didn't win one thing um and uh tim robbins was not nominated uh morgan freeman was for best actor um but tom hanks tom hanks won that distinction it would have been weird because you would have had to have put tim robbins and morgan freeman up for because they both were equally you know there wasn't a a, a, a supporting actor they were both leads in this movie um so there there are so many things in this movie so many um uh things that stand out to me um so many quotes hope is a good thing maybe the best of things and no good thing ever dies um i guess it comes down to simple choice really get hmm. busy living or hmm. get busy dying hmm. and literally red says as you said before hope is a dangerous thing Hope can drive a man insane. So, I, I want to hear from you. What, what, um, if there's if there's any one or two things that really stand out to you about the movie, I'll, I'll share mine. Mm -hmm. Two things. Um, the one is all based around uh, Andy locking himself in the 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 room and playing the opera mm -hmm. uh, and putting it on the PA system and bringing beauty into that place mm, mm. and knowing that he's going to pay a major, major price for doing this, mm, like, mm. you know, time in the hole, a lot mm. of time and get beaten mm. and everything else. Mm -hmm. But he, it, and music to him, as we find in a conversation that he then has, when he gets out of solitary, he has this conversation with red and music to him is hope. And he says, I can, I, I, I can keep it here. He points to his head and here he points to his heart. And he said, and nobody can take that away from me. And that's when red's like, what are you talking about? And he mm -hmm. says, you know, this is hope. And he's like, hope is, that's when red says hope is a dangerous thing. Right. And he doesn't just say it. He doesn't just say it. he gets up angrily from the, yes. from the dining table. Yes. Yes. And so, and so then what, 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 what then goes on to, to happen that I noticed in this, in this last, so as a, a scene later on, uh, or he asks him, do, do you, Red, Red tells me he had played the viol or the uh, harmonica in his past. And, and he, uh, he goes and gets Red uh, a harmonica later on in the movie and he gives it to him. And, you know, that music is representative of hope and Red can't mm -hmm. have hope. He can't, mm -hmm. he can't survive with hope. It's too mm -hmm. dangerous. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So he, he takes it to his, he says, thank you. He says, you're going to play it. He says, not right now. And he puts it down. And then he goes back to his cell that night and you see him thinking about it. He opens it up, he pulls it out and he's going to, he almost puts it to his lips, but he just can't do it. Mm. So then, mm. and, you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie. <laughs> so then Andy escapes, but before he escapes, he tells Red, you know, go to this field, right? <laughs> And go to this 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 wheat field, at, and you'll see the you'll see a long wall leading up to a giant oak tree, and that's where Andy pr had proposed to his wife, and he said underneath a a lava rock that doesn't belong there, I'm I'm leaving something there for you, and he says, what is it? And he's like, you'll 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 know it when you you when you get it basically. So then we cut to red. <clears throat> making this trek after he gets out, making this trek, he gets to, finds the field, he finds the wall, he looks up, he sees the tree and the soundtrack starts playing. And what, what instrument is it? A harmonica. The only time in the whole movie that we hear a harmonica because he now is going after his hope. He's now, he's now allowing himself to be hopeful. And, mm -hmm. um, that to me is just, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful cinema it's beautiful filmmaking and storytelling yeah. and yeah. and then i would say the other part of the story that really impacts me is i mean there's so many i mean yeah. just so many things that come through but but yeah. uh brooksy's story you know yeah. uh uh played by james whitmore um i was fortunate enough uh, james J uh, jimmy whitmore james son is a director out in california and out in hollywood and i was fortunate to work with him um yeah on a project and he just looks just like his dad and just a great guy with great stories and a re really really good director um so so the the idea of being institutionalized mm -hmm. the idea of he lived in that place for so long mm -hmm. that he had no he couldn't live in the real world he couldn't he couldn't do it and couldn't tolerate it he couldn't tolerate he couldn't tolerate it mm -hmm. um and, mm -hmm. you know, his, his character and his character's story is really, I think, um, super impactful too. And just, just yeah. great. So I would yeah. love to hear if there, if you have any, anything that, that, uh, how this, how this movie impacts you. Well, I think, I, I think for me, uh, I, you're, you're right. Uh, uh, and, and I think for me, it's not just having seen it, but it's having seen it multiple times. Right that it, it's kind of like going to listening to a symphony multiple times like yep. i mean it's not just oh the, the the movie on its own stands on its own as a beautiful piece of work which are which it is but it's also the relationship that i feel like i have with the movie and the way the movie is impacting me over time yes i remember i don't know what maybe the third fourth time or whatever that i'd seen the movie and uh you know, one of the th one of the things that one of the things that really captured me was, uh, you know, Tim Robbins' character um, comes into this space uh, of trauma. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, you know, the, the the penitentiary is is a placeholder for all that is awful about the world. It it's just it's it's the icon for all that is awful about the world. Um, but Robin's character does not come into that space um, as a blank slate. He comes into a place of trauma having already been formed. You don't know that until some of these moments show up where he behaves the way that he behaves in response to the trauma that he sustains, the traumas that he sustains, yeah. the common, the conversation that he has at, you know, at, at the, you know, at the, at the table mm -hmm. about, about hope is a dangerous thing. He like, he's, yeah. that isn't a thing that, that just, that, that just happened to him while he's been in prison. This is already something that's being formed. And, you know, it's, we're not, uh, you know, we have plans at some point down the line for talking about, uh, the the deepest place that the new book this this notion of, yep. of suffering 
And in that book, we're going to explore how when Paul talks about suffering, he doesn't just start by talking about suffering. Suffering sits in, in, in the Romans 5 passage. It sits in the middle of something, and it's, the suffering is preceded by something. We'll get to all that, but I, I think of that like Robin's character is preceded by the time he gets to the penitentiary. It's preceded by these experiences that he's had in his in his life, in his marriage. There's there's goodness and beauty, all the details of which we don't see, but we only come to see it as it emerges in the face of what we of of, of great suffering, of of great trauma. So that that's one thing that strikes me is that he's been formed already another thing this time around that, that I'm, I'm just really meditating on is there is the common enemy to everyone uh which is the senior uh the, uh, the senior guard yeah yeah what a character yeah i mean it just uh and i, I i'm blanking on the actor's name i can't uh, I, yeah but yeah. but he is the, the the he is the physical embodiment. I mean, you know, he in his in his suit, in, in his uniform, he, he is a his he's clean cut. He is all business. And at the same time, he is evil incarnate. Yeah. And he and 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 uh, he makes no distinction among the prisoners everybody is going to be treated the same way in order to make his life easier that's that's all that matters to him yeah and robin's character also brings something else into this space which is robin's actually has a gift yeah and that's the gift of being an accountant yeah and like this dude knows stuff and in his way of being helpful for the guard in a, I'm not, you know, in the in the way that you know the movie reveals, he sh he's actually showing kindness to the guard. Now, granted, it it you know, Robin's character isn't stupid. Like he knows that this is probably going to help his cause. Well, yeah. He, when he, the first time he offers to help, it's Brian's late, by the way. And the first time he offers to help him, if you remember, they're on the roof, tarring the roof, yep. and and he said he 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 goes over right over to the guard because he's talking about he's going to. He's got this inheritance and he's going to have to pay all these taxes. And he goes right over to him and the guard's going to throw him off the roof for approaching him. And he starts saying, wait, I can help you. I can help. And he's so he says, what do you, you know, basically he says, all I want in return is two beers for each one of my, my friends here. He didn't even, he doesn't, he didn't drink himself. If you recall, he yeah, just sat right. and watched them all be, have the opportunity to feel human for right. exactly 10 minutes at the end of their day. Exactly. Yeah. And in some respects, like the beer yeah. is like the on-ramp to the music. Yeah. So true. So true. Yeah. It's it's the on-ramp. It's yeah. his first and the, stick. And, and then the library, right, is another on-ramp. I mean, just there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you're as you're even saying this, I'm thinking about things that I hadn't thought about. This what what Robbins brings into the environment with him, this grace and dignity that he's able to hold on to in the in the worst of circumstances right mm -hmm. and this hope mm -hmm. that he's able to hold on to and how he's able to share it and shed this light you know to to other people that have none uh, you know <laughs> right. this movie is right. just yeah. yeah 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 well and and I and I would say th this this is an example uh you know at the at the end of the story i mean this this is a redemption story sure sure ergo yes um, Hence the name, yeah, um, and and I and I and I think it is also exemplary of what what it means to live in the real world. Mm. That uh, you know, it's possible that uh, a system like that, you know, uh, could have been perceived by the government. Somebody comes in to kind of do a survey and a once over of, oh, how are things here in the prison? And there's some top down, you know, just kind of, we're saying like, oh, we're gonna throw out all the bad guys. And, you know, we're gonna have some top down, you know, reconstruction of a really bad situation. I guess that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a bad thing to do, but right? we want justice to be done. 
And yet, there is something to be said about justice, which we would say is the social expression of beauty. Hmm. About justice being done from within the very heart of evil itself. It's not being forced from the outside. It is coming up from within and you see the change of heart in the guard. Now he becomes like super protective yeah. of Robin's character. You see the yeah. change in the heart of the guard. You see the change in the heart of Morgan Freeman's character. You see the change in the heart of others who start to, and you eventually see that beauty also becomes the judge wherein which it, it, it becomes a judge, but not without paying a price. Mm. Robin's character doesn't come in as some hero and, you know, f you know, fix things without nary a blemish. There was a price that he had to pay. Oh, big price. And it was awful in, I mean, several prices he paid. Yes. Yes. On the way to this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, 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 um, a lot of, Along those lines, the last thing that I, that I want to say about this is um, I really appreciate, and I think we've talked about this before, I really appreciated Frank Darabont's restraint, mm -hmm. um, oh. especially when it came yeah, to more. the violence being, you know, uh, put on Andy Andy's character. Mm -hmm. um, you you knew what was happening. You knew mm -hmm. the menace. You knew you knew what was happening. But he had the restraint to pan the camera away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's something so powerful about that to me mm -hmm. that it allows the imagination mm -hmm. to do some mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. um, it also, there, I, I don't think there's, there, there's not one iota of gratuitousness in this movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very streamlined when it comes to the, what you see on the street, on the screen. And, you know, I, I think that there's, um, he, he put sort of some restraint and parameters on, on the movie. Mm -hmm. And to me that those are two, two qualities that really lend themselves to creativity. Um, All right. and what, well, I mean, in, in some respects, what, what you are naming is that beauty is boundaried. Yes. Yes. It is boundaried. You have. A piece of music and it doesn't just go on forever right there there comes to an end and we don't we don't necessarily always like the end but there comes to an end you know when you're listening to the radio and there are those songs that you know they just kind of like have the end that just kind of like phase into right. the end like because right. we don't really want to let it go but like mm -hmm. that's not the way the real world is like we have to come to an end to things yeah. and boundary it it does require us to do work because we're on the other side of that boundary right? Yeah. We, we, us to do work. And yeah. so when he creates this film in such a way that he boundaries the trauma, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's actually also uh, like, like a good parent. He's inviting the viewer into a space that is really hard, but that does not overwhelm the viewer. Yeah. But allows me to like have to have to really contend yeah. with that instead yeah. of the artistic piece being completely responsible for all the what's happening. And, and here's the other thing. When we watch gratuitous violence over and over and over and over again, it stops having any impact on us. Right. Right. And and you can't feel, right? So so it's like it's like a performance. Um I when I've directed people on if if there's a if it's an emotional uh character or emotional part. And and the actor wants to just really let this let the tears flow, like, you know. I'm always like, no, hold it until you can't hold it anymore, because if you're crying the whole time, they don't have to feel it, mm -hmm. because you're feeling mm -hmm. it for them. But if mm -hmm. you are holding it back and holding it back, the audience is going to feel it so much more, so mm -hmm. much more than if you just mm -hmm. and like this with the with the violence. If you just mm -hmm. if if we were just exposed to it the whole time, and I know we're we're we're, we're running out of time now. Um, but this was anyway, this was, I'll just, uh, I'll just want to say this, yeah. this one last thing when it comes to memory, when it yes. comes to memory, yeah. um, 
part of what is crucially important about our practicing being on track to has to do with our willingness to hold things yeah in community with others and it reminds me of when we are doing work in confessional communities and we get to spaces where oh we get to the end of our 90 minutes of our time and somebody's going to have to hold something they don't just get to like just continue to say it or feel and i i can't do that if i don't have a community with whom i am pr- knowing that i'm not holding this just by myself yeah i'm doing this with others and this is what beauty invites us to do beauty is not just inviting to our listeners beauty is not just inviting each of you as individuals to encounter it it's sending the message that beauty is to be encountered in the context of community and it's in that community that we not only encounter beauty, but we begin to see it in each other, even in the places like in the Shawshank Redemption, where we would least imagine it emerging. Well said. Thank you for that. Thank you. This has been just really great. Dude. Great time well spent. Thank you so much. The whole day. Really appreciate it. Um, those of you watching on, oh, first of all, next week. Uh, so this week we have a little assignment for you. So uh, as you prepare for next week's episode, um, uh, we would love for you to take the time to listen to Gustav Holt's Jupiter Behringer of Jollity. Um, This is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous piece. Um, I've listened to it several times this week, and, um, and it has been a great way to put myself in the path of oncoming beauty, and I'm excited for you all to have the opportunity to do that and i'm excited to talk about it next week and for those of you who are watching on youtube stick around because amy's joining us right now thanks kurt love you love you man oh my gosh um (laughs) i I I I love that i can't i love that amy (laughs) jella's amy jella's standard introduction Yes, I love it. Which oh is my gosh. fabulous. I love thing. that. Is there another that. Standard? that should be the t-shirt. That should oh be the t-shirt. My oh my gosh. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gracious. Okay. So like the tracks, we could talk about the tracks for an hour, but the post show mm. is not an hour. Um, I love that. Uh, and the thing about this movie, movie is like, I wanted to say, okay, you guys took all the good stuff. But there yeah, is it's not so, true. Much. so much. No, good stuff. I know. And I, okay, so I'll start with great homework to watch the movie again, right? Mm, mm-hmm. But this was fascinating to me. Um, talk about observing without condemnation. Like when I started mm. to watch it, I was filled with anxiety because I was like, you got to get it. It's been years since I've watched this, but you got to get it. You got to understand it. You got to. Mm. Mm. And I'm like, mm. okay. Mm. Mm. It is to welcome, it is to wonder, it is to worship, mm. it is to work. It is to just mm. sit here mm. and watch the mm. movie and enjoy it. Mm. Mm. And that's where I thought. I wonder, like the, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you. I, just, I wonder how many of our viewers hmm, are having that experience with every assignment we give them. Because it suddenly becomes an assignment, right? What pep? Yeah. It is. You know, an I, I, I I've seen a couple of comments where people were have, like like with the with the um, Kingfisher's Catch Fire, like talking about. Yeah. Like, I don't get uh, it. This is I hard. Don't I don't. Yeah. 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 And that is the work. And like the sensing, like I kept going back to this week. Okay, we sense, and then we make sense, right? And yeah. so. It is like, the work for me initially is to not try to figure it out that is the work like set that aside (laughs) the sense it you're going to sense it you there is a price to be paid if we're trying to figure it out (laughs) Mm -hmm. because we missed the sense we're trying to reverse the order and we cannot do that yeah so then when i settled into it and just watched the movie and made some popcorn and thought let's see what happens um Okay, the harmonica, I totally missed that. That was fabulous. And then, Kurt, when you said the beer is the ticket to the music, like the. Oh. the <laughs> yeah. 
So when Andy, which the story of Andy, how he came to have um, records, albums in the yeah. library was yeah. fabulous. Yeah. So he's in there. You brought this up, Pep. He's in there. He locks all the doors. He puts, this will make me choke up. He puts the record on the turntable, puts it to the mic and plays it for the whole prison, right? And then Red's response, I'm going to read Red's response. It's Morgan Freeman. So I'm like, I'm not sure I can read a more, more <laughs> Morgan Freeman line, but I'm going to read it because his response is, because the piece was, were included Italian women singing. It was oh, an yeah. Italian piece. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, ha I have this quote. It's great. He says, I have no idea to this day what those two ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words. It makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage mm. and made those walls dissolve away. Mm. And for the briefest of moments, every last man in Shawshank was free. Yeah. Mm. And I was like, and I, I think I've said this before, Mary Chapin Carpenter, uh, I was listening to a podcast and she was asked like, what does this song mean to you? And she said, I don't want to tell you. I want to know what it means to you. Mm -hmm. Because if we know, it's like you guys were saying, the restraint that was shown in this piece lets us discover what it means to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like Red and that mm -hmm. song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, well, best use of a narrator in a movie ever. Oh. First of all, it's Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yeah. But but the, the writing was so good. Uh, yeah. 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 Kurt, you were going to say something. You, you know, well, it. it just reminds me of how, again... Like Freeman's that that quote, this sense that uh, beauty doesn't uh, uh, expect beauty does not like per Mary Chapin Carpenter. Not only does beauty not want us, it does not. It, it, beauty doesn't want to tell us what it means. It's not. It's mm -hmm. not. But it also does not want to uh, us to be forced to get it in the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beauty doesn't come to us with the expectation that we are going to get it, that we're going to understand it. It wants it. It comes to us and meets us uh, as we are able to meet it. Right. Rothko does not sit here on my wall and expect mm -hmm. to be understood. Mm -hmm. It's present. And this is again, this, this again. Oh, my gosh. This, this, this is Genesis one, verse two, over and over. God hovers. God hovers and then he speaks. God does not, God does not have expectation that the chaos is going to like shape up. Mm -hmm. God does not come to the chaos and expect us to understand him, to get it right. God wants us to anticipate that when he comes, he's wanting us to engage with him, to be as curious with him, about him as mm -hmm. he is about us. And he's not expecting us to get it all figured out before, you know, we watch the movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he does place demand, like the demand of engagement. Like his, his demand is like, well, the only way that I can be in the world is for you to engage with me. Like it's not, that's the demand. The demand mm -hmm. is the kind of like, like the demand that gravity places on us. Right. It, it It's just the way the world is. And like, we are either going to have to like, get along with it according to its terms or we're going to fall down and skin our knees mm -hmm. and so in that way yes it places demands on us in some way but not in the ways that we think it does and so the restraint of what it means to just hover mm -hmm. and then speak and bring order and purpose it's 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 like morgan freeman's voice it's it's like the restraint mm -hmm. that 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 the director is, you know, is displaying with yeah. a movie. Yeah. Yeah. So good. What a movie. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. <clears throat> it's been a while, I think, since I've been 
as uh, impacted by a movie as I am by this. It, mm. And I was so glad because I hadn't watched it in a while. Mm-hmm. I was so glad that because sometimes they can a, a movie can disappoint. Yeah. Uh-huh. In a, but you know real art lasts the test of time right mm-hmm. yeah. and this thing mm-hmm. really stands the test of time i mean it just mm-hmm. it's as I, I i enjoyed it as much if not more yeah. this time than the very mm-hmm. first time i saw mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. you know yeah i, I think just, i enjoyed it more yeah mm-hmm. more life yeah. It's been, yeah. Yeah. yeah more life has been lived yeah it was great what else aim anything else um let me, uh, what he really means is, what about what I what I said? <laughs> yeah, what about what I had said? I'm kidding. Oh, this yeah. was no, you're not. Andy. No, you're no, you're not. I I know, I know. This this was my question, like, and it was my. Yes. I mean, yes. Um, okay, so when Andy created, when he was telling, was he telling Red or he was telling somebody that he had created a fake person, like that he was, it was gonna Red make in the warden. library? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then it was like, well, no, that's not a fake person. That I mean, it is a fake person, but to see that it was totally used for something other than what he was saying there. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It was a surprise for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Mm. It was good, guys. It was great. Well. Next week. <clears throat> yes. All good things must be paused until next week yes yes okay yes indeed all right all right guys guys. love you guys see you next week bye this podcast is produced by kurt thompson pepper sweeney and myself amy cella audio production and editing is by keaton simons video production and editing is done by mark gould if you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on social media at Being Known Pod. If you like this podcast, tell a friend. If you love this podcast, tell everyone you know. And please like, rate, and review wherever you listen. Be well, be known.